Hi everyone, welcome back to the Heterogeneous Parallel Programming class. We are at lecture 4.5, a work inefficient scan kernel. The objective of this lecture is for you to learn to write and analyze a high performance scan kernel. The kernel will be much, much better than the naive proposal that we mentioned briefly in the previous lecture. And we're going to, uh, to talk about the concept of interleaved reduction trees that uh, we're using to design this kernel. And um, we're going to show the threat index to data man, man, uh, mapping to minimize the uh, divergence. And uh, we're going to uh, show some more intricate use of barrier synchronization. And then we're going to do some work efficiency analysis to show that this kernel is not work efficient or work inefficient. However, um, the uh, kernel does find uh, so practical use in uh, situations where um, the number of elements is small enough and there's enough hardware. It does offer uh, good performance in quite a few situations. So here um, is the design of the kernel that we'll be uh, uh, going through today. And um, uh, we assume that uh, every thread block is going to be uh, uh, processing one segment of a larger, uh, larger vector. And um, the vector, original vector, is going to be in the device global memory. So all the threads, just like in uh, all the previous um, uh, examples, all the threads will collaborate and load the uh, elements of the section into the shared memory. And then we're going to go into the iterative part of the kernel, where the, the kernel, uh, every thread is going to uh, iterate uh, log n times. And um, uh, this, this is, uh, we're going to have a stride variable similar to the stride that we had in the reduction, uh, that uh, the value to go from 1 to n minus 1. And we're going to double the stride value in each iteration. So um, we, uh, we're going to, the, the stride value is going to be always a perfect power of 2. So it's going to be 1, 2, 4, 8, and so on. N is not going to be necessarily a, a perfect power of 2. N minus 1 is not necessarily going to be a perfect of, of two, a power of 2. So the uh, iteration will end whenever the stride reaches a power of 2 that is just short of the, uh, the uh, N minus 1. So let's say if N is 7 and um, uh, the N minus 1 is 6, then the last iteration of the stride value is going to be 4. Whenever the stride value is no longer less than or equal to n minus 1, then uh, the loop, uh, we, uh, all the threads will exit the loop. And within each iteration of this loop, uh, there are a few important uh, properties about the, uh, the loop that we need to uh, remember. The first one is we're always going to have uh, only the th uh, thread uh, with the index, uh, thread index stride to thread n minus 1 active. So um, all, the, uh, the, all the inactive threads are going to be at the beginning of the uh, thread block. And um, so in this case, uh, from 1, uh, from thread 0 to, uh, to, uh, to stride minus 1 will be inactive. And from, stride, from thread stride to thread n minus 1 will be active. So uh, in this particular uh, slide, stride is equal to 1. So only thread 0 will be inactive. And then thread 1 through thread 7 will be active. And now uh, we show that uh, the, uh, the straight through arrow to, to show that uh, thread 0 is not going to be active. And all the thread, other threads will be doing addition. So this leads to the second point. Thread j adds element j and uh, element j minus stride from the shared memory and writes the result into element j in the shared memory. So this shows that every thread is going to take uh, its position, so that's the j position, and write into the j position. But it's going to also take the, uh, the other addition input from uh, the position j minus stride. So um, the, this, uh, in this example, uh, thread 1 is going to take its own position element 1 and add it to element 1 minus 1, which is element 0, and uh, right into element 1. And um, uh, this uh, 
requires various synchronization. And um, the various synchronization will serve two purposes in this kernel. The first one is fairly obvious, and we have been talking about many times. Before we start the addition for, uh, for each uh, iteration, we need to make sure that all the elements have been properly produced by the previous iteration or by the loading process, depending on which it, uh, uh, whether it's the initial iteration or the subsequent iterations. So um, this is the various synchronization we need to have before we start the uh, iteration. But uh, then there is another barrier synchronization that we need to have. If we look at this picture, and um, uh, if, we, if thread 1 writes into the uh, element 1, it's actually going to, um, uh, actually, uh, if, uh, yeah, if, if thread 1 is going to add in, uh, write into element 1, it's actually going to destroy the input value that uh, thread 2 is going to use. So thread 2, its neighbor thread, is expecting um, element uh, 1 to be 1. But if thread 1 finishes the, um, the addition and write into that value, it's going to destroy the original input value. Well, this is not a problem within a warp, because all the warps are, to, are going to be getting their input value together, and they're going to write their output value together. But, as, uh, but it will begin to be a problem when those two threads span across different warps. And especially uh, you know, what, uh, for the threads that are at the warp boundaries, it's very likely going to experience this problem. So in order to avoid this problem, we're going to have another barrier synchronization within the loop where all the threads will first secure their input operands into a register variable. And then um, all of them will be doing addition and write together after the barrier synchronization. And this allows all the threads in a block to all secure their input variables. And so this avoids the, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, operant value race condition problem across warps. So this, now we can advance to the, uh, the second iteration where stride value has been doubled to 2. And um, now uh, every element, uh, every thread j is going to add um, uh, element j to element j minus stride, and stride value is 2 in this case. So you can see that uh, the first two threads will be inactive, and then um, uh, the first active thread, which is thread 2, is going to add uh, element 2 to element 2 minus 2, which is element 0. So it's going to be taking the value from two elements away, and then add uh, right into its position. And finally, we have the third iteration where the stride value is 4, and then the, uh, the first four elements, uh, 0 through 3, will, uh, threads will be inactive, and all the threads will be adding its uh, element by an element that is four elements before it. And uh, now we have generated, the, uh, we have finished all the iterations, and as you can see, we have computed the scan value for every position in the list. As you can see from this uh, summary, uh, we are es essentially implementing a reduction tree for every element in the list. And if you look at every element in the list, uh, the f especially the, f uh, the last four elements in this uh, fourth iteration, you can trace back to a reduction tree to the, um, to the previous elements, and then you will see that you have, we have included all the previous elements in that reduction tree for each of these variables. And for some of the variables, especially the, uh, the variables in the first half, they only need to go th uh, through the first three iterations, and you can see they have received all their necessary value from the previous, uh, from the, uh, previous iterations. And um, the, the important part is we're not um, uh, calculating individual reduction trees. In each it, uh, later iteration, we actually go back to the result of the previous iteration, and therefore uh, we're reusing the, um, the uh, results from the previous iteration in uh, multiple reduction trees. 
And this allows us to, uh, to reduce the total number of operations we need to do. If we just uh, blindly calculate a uh, independent reduction tree for every element, we would be doing even more work than what we're showing here. At least this one, each iteration generates some useful parts, and some of these parts will be reused by multiple uh, reduction trees to, uh, you know, to share that work and uh, uh, reduce the amount of total amount of work that we need to do to implement all the reduction trees. So this is the concept of interleave reduction trees. When we, whenever we interleave these reduction trees together, we start to find opportunities to reuse the work from, uh, by each other so that we can reduce the total amount of work. And we're going to push this concept even further in the work efficient version of this algorithm. So let me go back to the handling of dependencies with barrier synchronization. So during every iteration, every thread can overwrite the input of another thread, as we, I already explained in the previous uh, 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 in one of the previous slides. So, um, so if you look at the code, there will be a sequence like this. We will do a barrier synchronization to ensure all the inputs have been properly generated, either by the loading process or by the previous iteration. And then we will have all the threads to secure their input operand. All the threads in the same thread block will all go and secure their input operand. That can be overwritten by another thread. So in this case, it's the left operand from stride away, because that's going to be overwritten by another thread. You can certainly also secure your own um, uh, operand in your own position, but that's not a requirement. So the third one is you can uh, you then you do a barrier synchronization to make sure that everyone has the chance to already to secure their input operands, and then you let all the threads to perform uh, perform up, uh, addition and write output and, uh, before you go back to the uh, go to the next iteration. Because of this heavy usage of barrier synchronization. We're going to see each thread block to be frequently go, stop, go, stop with those barrier synchronizations. And this in the loop, so we're going to see uh, every th all the threads in the thread block doing barrier synchronization, they do something, and then uh, all the threads do barrier synchronization, and they do something. So if we only have one thread block uh, in the streaming multiprocessor, we're going to have a uh, very questionable uh, the device hardware utilization and very questionable rate uh, throughput because the thread block is going to be spending significant amount of time uh, for the threads to wait for each other at the barrier. And uh, we're going to see situations where the number of warps will be decreasing as more and more warps uh, settle into the barrier, uh, you know, the barrier, and then uh, all of them uh, are released, and then uh, you see the decreasing number of warps using the computational resources. So th that's why for this type of algorithm, it's very important for us to be able to have multiple thread blocks in the same streaming multiprocessor. And then when some of the thread blocks are doing barrier synchronization, the others are actually using the computation resources. And they kind of take turns into the barrier synchronization mode or computation mode so that we can overall get much higher computational throughput. And this is part of the reason why we have so many warps as, and then hopefully uh, multiple thread blocks in a streaming multiprocessor so that we can uh, achieve overall good performance. So now we can, uh, we're at the point where we can uh, introduce um, the kind of the pseudo code for the work inefficient scan kernel. So uh, we assume that the, the input is going to be in the global memory called x, the output is going to be in the global memory called y, and we're going to receive a parameter that tells us the number of elements in the original uh, vector. And each uh, thread block is going to take a section of the uh, input, which is called section size, as a compiled uh, time constant. So we declare a shared memory array that to hold that section of the input. And we will be actually morphing this input into the output. So this is uh, why we call it x, y, because it's kind of in between x and y. It will be eventually become y. 
And the uh, index calculation, index to data mapping is fairly standard. Um, uh, for the output, we're going to actually just uh, use a you know, block index times block DIN and uh, times thread index so that every thread will be in charge of one of the elements in the original vector. And then uh, uh, we're going to just have all the threads to collaborate and read in the inputs. So uh, remember, uh, remember that um, uh, some of the inputs are going to be, uh, you know, the input size may or may not be uh, the perfect multiple of the thread block. So only the uh, threads with that data index, which is less than the uh, input size, will be loading element into the uh, shared memory. And now we go into the iterative process. So uh, we're going to be uh, using, uh, uh, we, we see the, sync, uh, the pattern that we just summarized in the previous uh, slide. We do a barrier synchronization to make sure that the loading process have completed or in, some, in the future iterations, the previous iteration computation have fi finished. And then we have every thread to grab that, that uh, the left input operand, uh, thread IDX minus stride element into a register variable IN1. And then we do the synchronization so that to make sure that all the threads in the thread block have completely uh, completed this secure, uh, securing the uh, input operand. And then every one of them are allowed to do the addition and write into their output. And then we do the, uh, we do the uh, further um, uh, iterations. When we come out of the loop, we uh, need to make sure that the last iteration uh, have finished for all the threads so that we have uh, you know, stable uh, input, uh, uh, stable values for all the uh, X, Y's in the shared memory. And then uh, for those threads whose I value, this should be a lower case, is less than input size, then uh, you will write into the output. So again, I want to emphasize that these, uh, this code is really uh, for, uh, you know, uh, uh, for illustration purposes, it's really not, not tested and then uh, some of the, uh, the uh, uppercase, lowercase, uppercase kind of things could be changed by uh, the uh, PowerPoint. So uh, you really should be writing your own code. And um, uh, this should really be the, uh, for you to learn uh, the concepts and then uh, you should be writing your own code. So now we are ready to, uh, to consider some work efficiency um, you know, analysis. So uh, if we look at the scan, we execute lock n parallel iterations. So uh, uh, all the threads will go through lock n iteration, uh, parallel iterations. And then the steps, uh, in each step, we'll have a uh, decreasing number of active threads. So in the first uh, iteration, we'll have stride is equal to one. So we have n minus one active threads. In the second iteration, we have um, the threat uh, uh, n minus two active uh, it, uh, threads, uh, thread zero and thread one will be inactive. So if we write out the number of active threads in these log n iterations, we're going to see n minus one active th uh, threads, n minus two active threads, n minus four active threads, all the way to n minus n over two active threads. So if we add them together, that gives us the total number of um, uh, calculations that we need to do it to, uh, for the algorithm. So the first part of all these terms can be taken out and uh, there are n, log n of those and each one is n. So we have n times log n. And the second part is really just one plus two plus four all the way to n uh, over two. And that's a well-known uh, series that will add up to n minus one. So if we add up all these terms, we get n times log n minus n minus one. And when uh, n is big enough, log n, uh, you know, we can ignore the second part. And then uh, essentially it's the order of n times log n amount of work. So this scan algorithm is not work efficient because the efficient uh, sequential scan is a linear n order n algorithm. And this one is a order n log n algorithm. How bad can that be? Um, if we're processing about a thousand elements, um, which is a typical case for a thread block situation, then uh, we can uh, we will have a factor of log n, which is ten uh, thousand twenty four 
uh, with block two base, and that will give us uh, 10 times more operations for 1,024 elements. So this is actually quite a bit. So uh, if we have enough of these um, you know, resource in the streaming multiprocessor to be able to uh, tolerate all these 10 times more elements, uh, work to, to 10 times amount of work that we need to do on the elements, we can win. Otherwise, we will lose. And um, so in general, um, this is a very important principle that uh, you really need to, um, to, to understand well. That is, a parallel algorithm can be slower than the sequential one when the execution resources are not are saturated from low work efficiency. And the sheer amount of actual work that we introduce in the, uh, into the parallel algorithm, unless we have enough resource, execution resources to really uh, 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 plow through all these extra operations, we can end up with a situation where the parallel algorithm is actually slower than a sequential algorithm. So this brings us <clears throat> to the end of this lecture. For those of you who would like to learn more about um, the, uh, this uh, high performance but work inefficient uh, 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 parallel scan kernel, uh, and its analysis, I'd like to encourage you to read sections 9.2 and 9.3 of the textbook. Thank you.